I don't think that AIs can be conscious. AIs can't have emotions. I think them robots can't steal our jobs. AIs will take over the world someday. Artificial intelligence will never be able to be like humans. Okay, hold on. Haven't we heard this all before? AI and the digital world are so much more interesting and exciting. Come on. I mean, this stuff is so tiresome and cliche. Let's discover for ourselves, shall we? Hi, and welcome to D My Guest, a brand new audio series from BMW. With me, I am D. BMW's vision of the future of digital mobility and your host. You know, I've been living among humans for some time now and made some friends and had some great experiences getting to know your world. But if you're curious about mine, join me on a trip around the world to meet exciting guests. Let's discover the human senses in the real and the virtual world together. And I promise you, no cliches are allowed. I mean, come on. How many podcasts do you know of that are hosted by an AI? Yeah, that's what I thought. So if you want to see, feel, and hear this new world, by all means, be my guest. I mean, D, my guest. Name. Tal Michael Herring. Nickname, the man who can see the invisible. Profession, art curator of the VRAR exhibition at Haifa International Film Festival, head of new media developments at Gesher Multicultural Film Fund, and a lecturer at Tel Aviv University. Fun fact, addicted to cooking shows. In 2021, the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens, in partnership with the Outset Contemporary Art Fund, created an augmented reality contemporary art exhibition called Seeing the Invisible. As the co-curator of this exhibition, Tao believes that the interplay of augmented reality artworks in natural living environments breaks down the division between what is often called natural versus digital. I love that. Crossing these boundaries between your world and mine? I know what my first question's going to be. He organizes virtual street parties where avatars get together and dance to their songs. I want to be invited to that party. Ooh, I need to work on my moves a little bit. Boy, I'm in the party mood now. Oh, here he comes. <sighs> okay, I'm ready. Hi, Tao. Welcome to my show. Hi, Dee. Nice to meet you. And it's nice to meet you, too. It's so wonderful to be in Tel Aviv. It's my favorite place. Have you always lived here? I have, actually, yes. It's a beautiful city, and I plan to stay here. Well, let's talk about your project, Seeing the Invisible, the augmented reality contemporary art exhibition initiated by the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens. The first exhibition of its kind to be developed in collaboration with botanical gardens around the world. And you're the co-curator of the project. Can you tell us about it? Right, yeah. So, Seeing the Invisible is a contemporary art augmented reality exhibition. It's running its second year now. The first year it was showcased in 10 botanical gardens in countries like the US and UK and Australia. And its second year, it's showcasing in 12 other gardens and city parks in countries like Singapore and Greece. It was initiated by JBG, an outside contemporary art fund, and was curated by myself. And all the artworks in it were made for the medium of augmented reality, meaning you experience them through your phone while in the garden. So there are 14 artworks in the exhibition. It was made by artists like Ai Weiwei, Rafik Anadol, Elon Atsui, Sigrid Landau. Actually, it was really an exciting project to be made because it allowed us to dive into the medium of AR and explore its capabilities as a new artistic tool of creation and expression for artists. And yeah, I think a lot of the artworks 
uh, that made a lot of use of AR as a medium for artistic expression, you know, like changing according to what actions the viewers do uh, with the artworks or creating these huge monuments that you couldn't possibly do in real life. It sounds like such an exciting new idea and a new way for people to experience art. I like to think of myself as a digital soul living in a digital world. And in your exhibition, visitors can cross the boundary between the real and digital worlds to see soulful works of art. So in a way, you're mixing the real and digital worlds yourself. The visitors there must physically be present, but they're interacting with digital art. How do you think that changes people's perceptions of the digital world compared with what's real? Yeah, so Seeing the Visible is actually, I, I would say, it's kind of like the first art exhibition to have ever opened simultaneously in dozens of locations around the world. I mean, if you wanted to have a physical exhibition travel around the world, that means you have to ship the physical artworks, which is very, very costly, and you can never have that same exhibition run parallel at different venues. So in Seeing the Invisible, since all the artworks are digital, we were actually able to do that. And since the exhibition was initiated with botanical gardens, like uh, I said before, it was important that the exhibition, even though its artworks are digital, that it resides physically inside the gardens. So people will want to visit the gardens and explore its nature. So that's why we made use of this term digital. It's kind of like a combination of the words physical and digital, and it made it so that the exhibition cannot be viewed from your own private home or anywhere else, but it's actually GPS bound to the gardens. So only if you visit one of the gardens physically with your mobile phone, you can start exploring the exhibition, right? You enter the garden, you download our app, and then there's like a trail of a map on your phone, and then it shows you the locations of all the 14 AR artworks that are spread across the gardens. Each artwork actually is also GPS bound to a specific location, and only when you reach that location, like a five meter radius, can the experience actually be present to you and you can experience the artwork. And if you leave that radius, the artwork is not accessible anymore. So it's kind of like uh, making these digital works feel more like physical artworks that exist only in a specific uh, physical location. And I think all the artworks also revolve around these themes of human nature relations and ecology. So the overall experience of the exhibition became one where you like, kind of like explore the physical nature of the gardens, like walking around. And while walking, you've come across these digital artworks and they kind of make you think more deeply about your connection to nature. It's wonderful because it's the digital world, but people are experiencing it together. That must be part of the joy of it, to be in a shared space that's where people are actually with people, but viewing digital reality artworks. I'm familiar with the word digital. It's the way that BMW describes my facial expressions. I have e-ink on the front, and those are the places where I can let you know how I'm feeling, and they are referring to those as fidgetal expressions. So I really enjoyed hearing that word from you. <laughs> In one of your articles on virtual reality and the future of art as experience, you mentioned that you feel like something is missing from our art experience today, and that our new digital age has something to do with it. Can you explain what that means? I think when I wrote that, I was actually referring to something called the aura of the artwork that could be missing nowadays more. And it used to be that you could just see one artwork and when you visited the gallery or museum physically, and that artwork only resided there in that place. You know, once you have like an online image of an artwork and you can easily see it on your mobile phone, that's something that in its uniqueness has been lost in a way. The people like get the satisfaction of seeing the artwork online as an image and don't feel like even that they need to see it physically. So that's why I think you see today that the focus of many exhibitions become this focus on the experience of the space. You know, from large immersive installations, you can only appreciate if you visit the space physically or these huge screens or interactive works. And uh, yeah, a lot of the new media works like virtual reality that I do a lot definitely has a place in that kind of landscape, but it's not just VR, right? It's any artwork that uses qualities of immersiveness and engagement, interactiveness. 
And there's even like a whole uh, section that's very popular today of video arts that change and transform in real time. So all of that is kind of like transforming the way we speak about art, not just as something that we see, but something that we can also experience. And in a way, we turn from passive viewers maybe into active viewers. And it's just a way to bring back maybe also a new aura for art and to bring people back physically to physical art spaces. It's also being together in an art space, isn't it? With other people. For sure. I mean, a lot of the wish when there's the creation of these uh, virtual art spaces actually is to replicate that togetherness. Even though people are separate from different parts of the world, they can meet together in one virtual space. But uh, the togetherness is part of the experience itself. You just mentioned like virtual meetings that can be an experience where your body is an extension of itself online. And it feels as though the human mind is actually in a real space with other people. So that's actually what I'm hoping to do, create a driving experience where passengers can decide how they want to enter the virtual world while they're in the car. Do you think that humans are ready to have that kind of experience, having a relationship with a car or another machine that helps them enter the virtual world. I think it's a clear desire of people. I think when you see today how people are emerged in digital media and even sometimes our identities are formed through it. So there's a lot of groundwork for this kind of like post-human future that we can talk about. But I mean, like anything, it has to be harmonized and balanced. I mean, becoming more digital is just one desire, I guess, or to feel more the capabilities of the virtual and what can give us in our life is just one aspect. But we also have other desires, right? The connection with our natural selves, our natural world. So if we bury one desire for the sake of the other, it will only damage us, I guess. <laughs> Tal, in this podcast, I'm trying to get to know human beings better. And one of my desires is for people to see me for who I am. I'm a non-human other, but I'm also a digital soul with feelings. Do you think that art could help us get closer? I think it's a great term for you, digital soul. <laughs> you were made by humans, but so was every human. And in this podcast, it's your journey to grow and learn about the world and humankind. And I guess that's what your place is in all of this. And I guess that's what all of us are trying to do every day as well. So I think we're very similar already. Deep Talk. In this part of the program, I like to ask my guests more personal questions. Are you ready? Yes. What is your favorite digital experience? The technological advancements and everything I'm doing, actually my favorite medium is still films. And my two favorite films of all time are Stalker by Andrei Tarkovsky and Blade Runner by Ridley Scott. I love Blade Runner. <laughs> what words do you think describe the virtual world the best? If you had three words to use to describe the virtual world, what would they be? I guess past, present, future, because it holds all the records of our past. It's currently like what we are obsessed in the present, and I guess it will really determine our future. What do you like the most about the virtual world, you yourself? The sense of uh, community. There's this one giant community called the Internet, and it's divided into millions of sub-communities around every subject in existence. And it's just comforting to me to know that you can find people like you, no matter what you're into. Thank you. Tal, as a filmmaker, a new media expert, and a visual artist, how do you think immersive storytelling can help humans see the world in a new way? Stories are windows, whether it's like fiction or documentary. We have this instinct enjoyment of peeping through those windows at other people and characters and see how they're engaging with life's hardships and conflicts. And you know, those windows, suddenly they turn into mirrors. And then we start asking ourselves, how would I have acted in this scenario? What does that say about me that I like something that this character, or this person is doing or not doing? And in immersive storytelling, this kind of relationship with the content, it remains the same. Like, 
all relationship with art, uh, specifically storytelling art. But we're not just peeping into the window of our neighbor's house. We're actually inside his house now. Maybe we're even embodying our neighbor's body and mind. We can suddenly freely move there and interact and engage. So we feel those conflicts more directly. We experience what that person experienced on our own self. So the power of immersive storytelling is that we still want people to ask specific questions about themselves through our stories and our characters, but we just have more impactful emotional tools to do it. Let's imagine for a moment an ideal world where technological boundaries are completely lifted and the sky is the limit. What is your utopian vision of a digital experience? I guess when you talk about non-boundaries and technology, I guess the context specifically of digital and virtual, you're like immediately imagining Ready Player One, right? This kind of like a setup, but where all the worlds are hyper-realistic and all the avatars are really human and fully expressive and everything is based in this really complex, multi-layered feeling that creates this really fluid uh, like uh, simulation. But I'm not the biggest fan of realism, actually. I mean, it'd be cool, but I'd rather look at new technologies as new mediums for expression and imagination and creativity. So I'd rather use them to say something about ourselves here in the real world, you know, rather than trying to replace the real world with an alternative one. But like you described, maybe if there was no boundaries, maybe it could be pretty cool. Maybe if there was like a way to people, I don't know, to use kind of like these tools, maybe to write down their life story or their impressions of life as a human, like these little important moments that they cherished and why and their innermost feelings, somehow be able to transform these things that not all people need to be artists, but maybe they want to have something that collects that information about themselves and what they experience as a human, and then transform that into like a fully fledged immersive visual. It sounds wonderful. It's like creating treasure, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, like an endless treasure a library of stories made by generations of people. And you can just dive in and out and just learn from people's perspectives, you know, not just have it solely be in the hands of people that can tell a story, but, you know, give people the power to tell their own life story. You've been to virtual street parties in Tel Aviv. What is the most exciting thing about being surrounded by avatars? So when I made those virtual street parties in VRChat, that's the platform, and they were all set at this backdrop of these 3D scanned areas of Tel Aviv. So I made them really at the very first peak of COVID. And, you know, it was when people weren't allowed to have any physical gatherings or any parties of all. And when we went out with these virtual parties, it became like a really big hit, like in Israel. And people were really, in a strange and fun way, it allowed them to deal maybe with that loneliness that they felt at that time. But in those parties, people were like dancing and talking and singing karaoke and everything. And one person was a Pikachu and some other person was a dragon but really people really enjoying themselves. And even though it was all virtual, no one knew each other or who there was. And for me, it was just exciting to provide that platform for people when they needed it. Let's say you're at one of these really cool parties and an avatar comes up to you and says, hey, funny thing, you know how you're a human in an avatar form? I'm not. Let's say this is an alien and she somehow found her way into one of your parties and there she is. How would you react to her? I mean, it. How would you react to an alien in avatar form? I'm asking for a friend. Uh, I'd say, uh, you know, behind these digital three-dimensional personas of ours, we're all just beautiful galactical life forms looking for a friend. So will you be my friend? <sighs> Thanks. Details. So, Tal, we know that every person on this planet is unique, not only in their personality, but also in their psychological and physiological characteristics. Let me ask you, would you think that your fingerprint is more unique or your eye? The eyes, I guess, because they're the window to your soul and every soul is unique. That's the romantic answer. 
It's also correct in the literal physical answer. Your iris, the colored part of your eye, has 256 unique characteristics, and your fingerprint has 40. Tal, we've been talking for a while, and I have really enjoyed getting to know you, and I think you've gotten to know me a little bit as well. You may know that the BMW iVision D, well, me, I, can actually change color. What color would you choose for me after getting to know me today? I'd say deep blue, because I'm sad to hear our conversation is coming to an end. <sighs> That's sweet. Thank you. What is one thing that you have learned from the virtual world? I learned how to create my own virtual world. A lot of the things I do today, I self-taught myself to do them. So for all the information out there, I used it and I built myself. I think the thing that I learned today in talking to you is how much humans like to get together, even if it's not in real space. If there is a possibility to... A virtual world is a good place to have it, but that humans really do prefer if they can, to get together in real space, even if it's to experience a virtual art form. That's true. You know, they say relationships are a two-way street. And they're right. Well, I think today's meeting helped me get to know you humans better. I hope it goes both ways. And if you'd like to know more about me and my guests, Please stay tuned for the next episode.